housing inequality. It's, it's a very difficult word, I know. And uh, my colleague, Marre Karu, was the first one to, to mention that word to me, and it took a while for her to explain that I understood what it means. But she will tell all about that. She will also tell what it means for gender equality, what did we find out about, this, about the intersecting inequalities, and in the panel following that, we will address the most, most important question, what can we do about it? Um, so Marre Karu, she's my colleague from Ege since 2015. She's a researcher, has been doing a lot of work in uh, social policies, in the gender perspective in social policies. She, she's got a lot of experience in the, in the work like life balance issues, also in the issue of, of fatherhood, which are all closely related to gender equality. But now we're about intersecting inequalities. Marre, please. Hello. Um, Commissioner Jura asked how to achieve better results. And as we see, everybody's really disappointed here. So we really need to see and think what to do about it. And uh, yes, as Mira said, my answer would be that we need to look things, gender equality from intersectional perspective. Policies need to reach everybody. Uh, intersecting inequalities. Indeed, Indeed. what it is. Um, the concept was introduced at the end of last uh, century by Kimberly Greenshaw. And the best way to explain what it means is to bring some examples. And the example which she stumbled upon, she saw uh, one court case uh, of Emma de Grafenried. Uh, she was an American, African-American woman who took a company to court because she was saying that she's discriminated uh, on the basis of being a black woman. Uh, the company didn't hire her, and she found it uh, discriminatory. The court dismissed her um, case, saying that there is no sex di discrimination because there are women working in the company. Uh, the court also said there is no race discrimination because there are Afro African-American people working in the company. But what the court didn't see was that all women were white women working in secretarial work, office work, and all men, uh, they were doing some heavy construction work, uh, were, or African-American were men. So there was not a single African-American woman in the company working. So there was no uh, sex discrimination. There was no race discrimination, but still... She was in the middle of this situation, being impacted by both. So the roads intersected for her. The road of uh, the, um, sexism or sex discrimination and the road of um, racism. So it's kind of like a crossroad. Another example uh, from more recent times. It's from 2009, and this lady is uh, Miriam O'Reilly. She used to be a TV presenter in BBC for over 20 years until uh, she was dismissed. She worked in a very uh, long-lasting um, TV show called Country File. Uh, it became so popular that uh, it was taken from daytime show to a uh, primetime show on Sunday evenings. And uh, the producer decided that the show needs some freshening, freshening up. And this meant that they dismissed actually three, no, four uh, presenters. All of them were aged 50, 50, 40 women. One presenter was left, a 70-year-old man. Uh, all the women were replaced by much younger presenters. So... Uh, Miriam was devastated to lose a job she loved, but she also felt that this is really unjust, and she felt this is a part of a bigger problem. This is part of a problem of having very few older women, and I don't know if 50-year-old is actually old, but you don't see a really 50-year-old woman on TV screens much. So she took the um, BBC to Employment Tribunal, saying that she's discriminated as older woman, on the basis of being a woman and on the basis of being older. So it's a case of ageism and sexism. And uh, she did get the 
the court, uh, the, the tribunal said that yes, it is age-based discrimination, but not uh, sex. And of course, it didn't say it's intersectional. But it did raise a lot of questions and discussions in the UK, but also elsewhere, about the issue of having kind of double standards about age for men and age for women. It's okay to be an older wo uh, man on the screen, but older woman, even Miriam was saying in the interviews that she got several comments over the years about, you know, be careful about the high-definition TV, all the wrinkles, and maybe you should uh, consider Botox, and all this hair, maybe you have to color them, and so on. So she had reasonable reasons to think that this is really about the appearance, not about her ab abilities. So the bottom line is that we do have um, discrimination, yes, of course, by gender, but there are other forces in the society like ageism, racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, ableism, and you can go on. And uh, these also play a role here because all these forces are also different for men and women, the way they impact the lives of men and women. And if you look around you here, you also see we are already having different people here, different ages. Some have children, some don't have children, some have grandchildren, some are healthy, others maybe less healthy, and so on. So um, if we go now to gender equality index, uh, the reason why we have this uh, intersectional perspective is that we believe that if we look at the index scores and we see it's not changing much, we need to see deeper, um, not only gender gaps, but we look at gender in connection with age. We look how gender and country of birth intersect. We lo look at uh, people uh, with and without disabilities, men and women, and we look how parenthood and family type impact the gender equality, men and women. The list is quite short. We are very well aware that, and it has been discussed already, that there are lots of other intersections which we unfortunately were not able to cover. Uh, race being one, sexual orientation, Roma people. It's because of the data availability, because we have very high standards for data. It has to be comparable across all the countries. And... Uh, this is actually one of the um, messages from our side as well, that we do need better data. And also the categories which we use or the groups which we, I, we use are quite broad. So to have more detailed and more uh, comparable data. And I forgot the level of education we also look at. <laughs> so to come back to the uh, structure of index, um, so this is the core index, and as mentioned before, this analysis I'm going to talk about is not impacting this uh, core. It's around it. So we take the variables or the ingredients of the index and we look deeper one by one, and it doesn't impact what is in the uh, score. Uh, and we do not look at everything, because for power, for example, we are lacking information about who is in power. Are they old? Are they young? And so on. So... Uh, but the other domains are covered. And uh, I will now show you a couple of examples because the information is, as you can imagine, quite rich. So I will start with uh, care. This has been already mentioned and discussed here today a lot. So this is one of the uh, domains also which is not doing so well. And, of course, the family composition plays a role here and having, having children. So we compare people who live alone, men and women, and we see that 8% of uh, uh, women who live alone and 4% of men who live alone take at least one hour per day to care for children or grandchildren or elderly or disabled. So any, any care responsibilities. There is a gender gap small. Uh, then we look at couples without children. So it's two adults living together. Maybe their children are out of the home already, uh, a bit more, care responsibilities, couples with children. Of course, it's clear that the majority of uh, care is carried by couples with children and the, there is a gender gap of 80 f uh, from 85 to 
meaning that 67% men, men, of men care for children at least one hour. And there is also lone parents. The gender gap is even higher. Uh, there are several things I want to show here. The obvious is, of course, that women, there is a gender gap. But I want to also emphasize that there are families where there are no children, young children, and, um, young children under 18, who do have care responsibilities. So this means that we need to look further from children and child care. We really need to look at the care of elderly and, and how people have different caring responsibilities and also people with disabilities. But here I want to also emphasize, people with disabilities, disabilities are also carers. There is um, actually 29% of women who have disabilities are taking care of somebody daily and 20% of men. So there is, there is more to, the, to it. So if we plan family uh, work balance policies, care policies, then it needs to be taken into account. Secondly, we say that men do not care. Well, there are groups of men who do, for sure. And we need to also see how important the work-life balance policies are for this 67% of fathers who uh, daily take care of their children, but also the rest, why they don't. So we maybe need to provide some support and policies for them. Um, let's look how... Your country of birth impacts the uh, care responsibilities. We compare three groups. People, national born, who are living in a country where they were born. <coughs> born in Belgium, living in Belgium. Then we have another group. You are born in one of the EU countries, European Union countries, and you have moved to another European Union countries. And then we have a third group who are born somewhere outside of EU but are living now here. Uh, the data is from 2014, so it doesn't cover the most latest trends, though. But what we do see here is that, yes, of course, there is a gender gap, but the highest care responsibility or the burden is for women who are born outside of the EU. I think it's a very useful tip for the policymakers, because if we want to improve the employment rate, let's say, for the uh, migrant women, we need to provide them affordable childcare and other policies to help them. <clears throat> and now we are moving to the other domain, very strongly connected, domain of work. Um, here we are looking at the employment participation. But as Yolanta already mentioned, we are not looking at the regular employment rate. We look at the full-time equivalent uh, employment rate. Again, a bit con complicated concept, but what, what it means is that uh, we do not count the heads of working people, but we do take into account the working time. If you work part-time, you are half a person in this calculation. So, and this is the reason also why the rates are a little bit lower, for, uh, especially for women, um, because the part-time work is higher and also men partially work. So it's in comparison to regular employment rate, it's lower. Um, and when we look at people living in different households, different families, couples with children have the largest gender gap in employment out of all the groups. We looked at disabled, of, with uh, migrants, everybody. And this is the largest gap. It's 28 percentage points. So this is a clear impact of parenthood. The employment rates are quite high, especially for men, but the gap is very big. Then we look at lone parents. So this is literally an adult person living with their children, so no, nobody else in the household. And um, what we see is that the employment rate for women is pretty much the same as in the couple with children. But the employment rate for lone fathers is actually lower uh, than for the fathers living in a couple. So this most likely is the fact that the impact of parenthood is stronger for these fathers. They do not have a partner to support them. So they do feel the uh, impact of parenthood in the employment. Another intersection is intersection of education and sex or gender. Um, 
And here's a very clear trend. First of all, the higher the education, the higher the employment rate. Also, the higher the education, the smaller is the gender gap. And clearly, the most disadvantaged group here is low-educated women. Uh, only a very small fraction of uh, women of, with low education work, 17%. And uh, as half of the low-educated men's employment rate, 34. Also very slow, uh, low, but it's double the uh, um, woman employment rate. So if we want to improve the employment rates in general in the society, then you know where to look. So low-educated women have, a, have a great potential here. And also another study of ours showed that actually uh, low-educated women, among them there is 17% who have never worked. And uh, we looked at different ages. It doesn't get better. It's not only the older, low-educated women, also now the younger ones. So if, you, if, if, if women drop out of the education early, then the labor market will be closed. Another very important group to look at is people with disabilities. Here again, we can see that there is some gender gap. So this remains throughout all the groups uh, in employment. And also we see that uh, people with disabilities are uh, having very low employment rates. Yes, and to sum, sum up the work domain, the policies um, really need to look at these dis disadvantaged groups. First of all, yes, work-life balance policies for both men and women, but the yeah, women with, um, and men with low education and disabilities is, this, is the resource to look at very logically connected, a third domain, domain of money. And uh, first, let's have a look at monthly earnings. Um, this is not a pay gap, so it's me uh, measured differently. It's monthly earnings, so it, again, is impacted by the fact of being work working part-time. And we look how the gender gap in earnings differ by the family type. The smallest is among people who are living alone. This may be also younger people or the already older people. Then uh, it's only 14% difference. Uh, couple without children, 30%, it's a bit higher, but among those can be really a, uh, also uh, older couples uh, whose children have moved away already. So by the end of, end of the career, the gender cap can increase. And a uh, couple with children, pay gap is 38%. So not only the women work less, but if they work, the pay is lower. And lone parents is 40%. And all of this is also very directly translated to poverty rates. So the poverty rate of lone mothers is 33%. So a quarter... No, a third is in poverty out of uh, all lone mothers in Europe and 23% of lone fathers. So this, this has very logical following. The time use, the labor market, the income and the poverty. And to end up, and, um, I want to show once also one graph by the member states. This is a kind of um, evidence about the long-lasting inequalities in the labor market, but in the society in general. This is a poverty rate of uh, men and women aged 75 and more. In most of the countries, the gender gaps in poverty are very large. Of course, there's a lots of uh, variety, and this is also one of the things that you need to also look at what is happening in your member state. But in general, on average, 18% of older uh, women and 11% of older men are in poverty. So this is, this is how it <laughs> all ends <laughs> if we don't do anything about it. So bottom line, how to achieve better results. We need to make sure the policies reach everybody. We need to take intersectional perspective for this. We need to look at the different groups and see why the domain results are not improving, or why, what, what is the problem? Who has the most problems? Um, 
And very importantly, we need to see what we can do about the data because we still don't have information about many groups and very likely many of the groups are the most disadvantaged. Thank you very much, Marde, for, for taking us through this rather complex new approach that, that we, are, we are using in the, in the index and which indeed gives a much more nuanced picture of, of how the situation is for, for different women and men in Europe. And now we will move on to our panel discussion. First of all, I would like to introduce on stage um, uh, Ernest Urtason. He is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, he's been active in uh, youth organizations ever since he was 15 years old, so, so that makes already, already quite a career. He's, he's done a career both in politics and in the diplomatic service. And uh, he's also, in addition to, to looking into the youth issues, also been very engaged in migration issues. So, so he will be able to, to talk, talk about that as well. Please take a seat. Thank you. And then... The next one I'd like to ask to the, to the stage is uh, Irena Mosova. She's a director of the Directorate General for Justice, Consumers and Gender Equality, or DG Just, as we say, as we are friends. Uh, so she is responsible for the area of Aegis work. And uh, she's a person who you would meet in, you would meet in, in uh, discussions and meetings where future of gender equality is discussed and, and also this, this new perspective of, of people of different groups is, is of course, very much present present there. She's got a long background in international cooperation. She's also worked in, um, in different uh, international assignments, also in the Czech administration. And uh, she told me yesterday that if there is something that is really close to her heart, it's human rights. Thank you. Welcome to the panel. Uh, and then I'd like to call for uh, Pirko Mahlamäki. Uh, she's um, Executive Committee Member of European Disability Forum. She comes from Finland. Uh, she's worked in, in various projects uh, and led projects to improve the situation of women with disabilities, both in terms of preventing violence, for providing victim support, and also to, to provide independent living solutions. And she's a very active vo voice. I can tell you I'm from Finland, both in Finland and, and, uh, and internationally. So welcome, Pirka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then the fourth, fourth member of this panel is uh, Pavel Trantina. He's the president of the Section for Employment, Social Affairs and Citizenship at the European Economic and Social Committee, also another important EU institution in the field of gender equality. And uh, he's, been, he's been an active member in, in the political sphere, in the administration for, for throughout his career. And the, the situation of young people has always been uh, very close to, to his area. And I, I saw that, that he's also been an active member of the scout movement. So, so that's, uh, he will bring that to the table. And yes, Marle, please, if you can just join us so that in case we need some clarification, we have got, we've got an expert here in the round as well. So first of all, I thought maybe we would, we would get some spontaneous reactions to what we've just heard. Maybe, Birka, would you like to say what, what, uh, what, is your, I was, what is your feeling? I was so taken aback by the, by the huge gap in... Uh, uh, the women with disabilities education and the and the low um, low education achievement levels that I think will be a major factor in the future to to really to really make it even harder to access a labor market or access any meaningful uh, income and also I was so um, so intrigued and happy that you, Maru, also mentioned the fact that disabled women themselves are carers in many instances. There are many households in Europe with uh, persons with older age where the one who is less disabled tries to be a carer for the one who is a little bit more disabled. And that is something that Europe will also have to look into and often it's the often it's the woman in the family who has the has the care uh, uh, care burden or not burden but additional um, well let's be honest and say that it can be a burden to care for uh, someone with severe 
and permanent impairment. Thank you. Ines. Yes, please. I think you need to put it on. Yeah. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me to that uh, to that panel. It's 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 really an honor. And um, uh, well, y you uh, firstly maybe to say that uh, the the index is extremely useful for us as legislators in the European Parliament. Uh, I was rapporteur for the gender equality report, yeah. um, uh, the large gender equality report of the Euro Euro European Parliament. All our analysis and our recommendation policies were based on data provided by the former index. And I think um, um, it's not only that I want to recognize the, the, the work, it's also a call uh, for all EU institutions to take all these data into account. Because one of the things that uh, those of us that are worried about gender equality, we need the most is to have available data. And one, and I liked a lot the presentation that was done just now. This um, intersectional uh, analysis that is being done will have a lot of policies, because it's true that it's very difficult sometimes to quantify phenomena of double discrimination in many many areas. And there is yeah. one area that I n know particularly, which is the area of migration and refugees, where sometimes it's very difficult to identify those phenomena because our policies are completely gender blind completely gender blind and there was a specific report uh, also in the european parliament about discrimination on uh, or women uh, or discrimination for gender grounds uh, uh, on um, um, uh, in relation to the refugee policies and what was happening and all, and we, we didn't have any kind of data so i think this is absolutely the, the way forward uh, to try to see uh, uh, to identify this uh, this uh, double discrimination phenomena so i think i want to thank again Ege because i think this is extremely useful Yes, please. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mari, for an excellent presentation. Um, I understand that in this plenary, so there are many people working in the field. Uh, professionals, representative of the member states, representative of the states still aiming at a, a closer cooperation with the European Union, and uh, professionals in the field in a way. And uh, I was a little bit disappointed when I saw the outcome of the slider um, uh, um, voting, that the main perception here in this plenary was being disappointed. Because I'm coming from the country uh, behind the Iron Curtain, and I still remember how uh, was the gender equality celebrated in these countries before the fall of the war. The only way of celebration was that on the 8th of the March, so we've been given a red flower while the men get drunk, so we've been cleaning the room after the drinking, of course. So this was the way how the gender equality was celebrated uh, um, uh, in the country I know best and many others. And I think that what, is, what should be resonating today in this plenary as well and in this hall is that we should be proud on the achievements. We should be proud of the achievements that Europe has done. We should be proud by the for example that Europe is giving to the world. I think it was the Swedish minister, she mentioned that today we celebrating the International Day of the Girls. And they, we should be proud on the way we are paying to our daughters, to our granddaughters in the future. And this is important. Maybe so the world is not perfect. We are not perfect. Uh, the European Union is not perfect. There is a, certainly a very important room for improvement. But with, without being really acknowledging where we stand and what we have done already, so it would not be complete, the picture. So this is my first remark I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say. Secondly, as uh, uh, in my current capacity working for the Commission, I think it is extremely important to have the uh, robust data, to have a credible data which we can use precisely as a legislator, presenting legislative and non-legislative proposals to the member states. You heard it as well today for the answer on the work-life balance. Uh, do we have the competence? We, do we have uh, uh, the, the right, actually, to propose uh, legislative proposals in the field, which is mainly domain of member states? Yes and no. And this is precisely the data which show us the deficiencies of the purely national policies, which gives us the possibility to address issues, to address the phenomena, and to improve the life of the European citizens. So this is my second remark, because I think it is extremely important to have robust data index produced by AGE with a specific focus on the phenomena, which can then be a vehicle to present more targeted national policies, local policies, regional policies, even cities' policies, in order to address those 
challenges of today and of future. Thanks also from my side for the kind invitation. Uh, I very much appreciate that new, uh, new approach to the intersection inequalities because this is something that uh, uh, in the European Economic and Social Committee we are trying to introduce. But uh, as Ernest has said, uh, actually we are doing it gender blind. Uh, in my section, uh, for social affairs, employment and citizenship, we have three permanent bodies, so-called, which are dealing with, uh, with uh, some phenomena. One is Roma, second is disabilities, and the third is migrants. And actually, I always try to encourage my colleagues to interlink what they are doing. So we were having interesting discussions about uh, uh, disabled refugees and stuff like that, but never so far we have tackled specifically the gender issue mm -hmm. and it seems that yeah at least from the data that we have seen but yeah from the daily realities that this needs to be tackled uh, uh, on a purpose mm -hmm. that we need to uh, to start to think also in these terms so i take it as a lesson uh, for myself what we can do better in in our committee and already this is quite a good achievement of this uh, event for myself and our committee Thank you. And you can now see an example that it's possible to do. It's complicated as the colleagues, but it is possible to be done. Okay, thank you very much for these, these first reactions. I would now like to uh, give the floor to Pirko, yes. who, who, would, who has something to share with us from the... I just, uh, I just wanted to say that, of course, uh, of course, we can be proud of the achievement of the last 60 years. And of course, we need to be uh, proud of all the all the progress that uh, has been ta has taken place in terms of gender equality but i think we cannot really be proud when we look at the when we look at the figures given today about the gaps that still exist in employment in education in income in in and particularly in the in the area where lots of work has been done to prevent violence against women gender based violence and uh, violence within the family. So that's why I reacted because, of course, we, of course, we must be proud of of the history, but we can't be pr proud of the present situation. We need a new, we need a new launch forward. We need a new moon program or Mars program in terms of the gender equality to really move forward more effectively than we have done the past years, as the people tell us. Yes, now, now we are into, into the area of, of, uh, or era of, of uh, designing this new Mars program for gender equality. But, but uh, if we look at the, the current uh, programs that we have in place, for example, the European Agenda on Migration, how could that be more effective um, by setting a gender, uh, gender specific targets? Anybody? This is one of one of the pillars that, that we are using. One of the policy policy documents. Well, um, well, first of all, um, what I would like to say is that um, uh, before I get to the topic you asked, um, one of the things that the index has helped a lot, and I want to say that uh, from the beginning, is to have a clear picture that actually uh, we are moving backwards in some very concrete fields in terms of gender equality. This is something that um, it is not perceived at the, actually it is happening among fellow citizens. And this is why the index is so important, because we have data that this is actually happening. This is what actually we try to do from the European Parliament with the report, is to try to politically say, look, this is what the index is telling us. And um, I see from the data that, uh, uh, that, um, that uh, you have been presented, we are, with getting your index, we are still at 60, 66.2. This is very low, uh, and so we need to be aware, and also institutions need to be aware. Now, um, w and one of the things uh, that I, I want to insist as well as a request, uh, we will have uh, in the coming uh, days. In the coming days, there is this discussion of the creation of the of the EU mechanism on and on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights. 
I think the index should be included. We cannot avoid having this mechanism without a gender perspective. This is something also I wanted also to make very clear. It's absolutely we need absolutely to have that included. So now getting to to the, to the migration uh, policies, uh, what we have identified very clearly is some phenomena uh, that were happening on the ground, but that had not at all any answer in terms of uh, of gender equality for instance when the, when deploying the facilities for supporting the reception on the borders of the eu there was no training at all on how for instance when a woman was traveling and and, and suffering gender violence there was nobody prepared there to to to, to have attention nobody in the detention centers no facilities at all for women that were suffering gender violence, sexual violence, harassment, etc. We even have notified cases that this harassment, harassment came from even from officials. So in all the deployments of the instruments that, uh, that uh, not only member states but only EU put in place, there was, this was completely abandoned. And um, I think now we have a, a good understanding of the phenomena but still no answers from the side of the policies. Um, and this is something uh, that, that uh, I think it's very clear when we talk about, uh, the, about double discrimination uh, uh, situations. When, we, you, when you do develop a, a particular policy on a phenomenon and it's gender blind, you automatically create double discrimination situations. And I think for, for, for the refugee policy that was very clear. So now we understand the phenomena. But now we need also to put that, uh, that uh, the gender perspective in practice, which we haven't. And I can recommend you to read the report that we did specifically on gender equality in refu and, and on refugee policies, which we have lots of proposals on how we could do that. Maybe <clears throat> some small remarks. Um, uh, I fully share what uh, you said. Um, we don't have a robust data on the migration flows. Uh, while we know intuitively that uh, gender is something which is a, a very important influence, not only on the starting, uh, triggering the migration flows, uh, the, the gender somehow is a detrimental factor uh, for the social networks of the migrants when um, migrating. Uh, we have as well uh, the gender differentiation between the uh, integration, exclusion, uh, we have seen so how the the, the women with the um, with the background outside of the European Union, so they are in principle uh, they are stuck at home, uh, caring daily about the families without any remuneration, without any perspective to get uh, employment, to get improved the uh, practical knowledge and education, despite of the fact, and I understand from the intersection as well, that in terms of the of the um, education, so the migrant women sometimes, so they are even better educated than migrant men. And this is a phenomenon which I find extremely interesting because there is probably room for precisely um, uh, member states and the organizations working in the inclusion part to look at in a more solid way, forward looking, etc. The response is not uh, is not, not easy here. Uh, there are, of course, programs. Uh, you mentioned the inception centers. EASO has a program. We have, uh, Commission mentioned here, the um, uh, focused year of action against the violence against women. So there's, there is a methodology being um, jointly uh, produced together with different services precisely to address uh, the gender, but as well the uh, sex issues of, uh, of the migrants in order to uh, provide uh, measures which will avoid precisely this, uh, this double discrimination in the migrant flows, but there is a lot of to be done. But should we mention as well the legal migration as one of the component of the migration agenda, or which is uh, uh, one of the issues uh, in 2015, so we had some 200,000 only uh, blue visa, visa issued by the member states. We know that Europe is aging, we knew that Europe is in, uh, in bad need of uh, of uh, highly qualified, skilled uh, uh, workers, mainly in the, ed in the areas of uh, high-tech technologies, health, social services as well. So there is a lot of, it is a challenge, uh, 2015, 1.5 million of, uh, of refugees, but at the same time, it is a great opportunity with the aging problem and with the need of the specialized care, uh, not only for children, but mainly for the elderly and as well the people with disabilities. 
just to add to <clears throat> what Mrs. Mozova just said uh, about uh, the, uh, the labor effect, let's, uh, let's say, uh, in the aging uh, population in Europe. Uh, well, we know that despite the lack of precise data, the trend is that the immigration is getting feminized and that at the same time uh, women are facing twofold, uh, uh, twofold uh, problems. That means actually being women and being immigrants. Uh, and I'm not talking about the highly skilled immigrants. Let's take the larger uh, proportion of the women uh, with, let's say, lower, uh, lower education. Uh, still, I believe, and we in the committee believe, that they represent uh, an important source of labor force uh, for Europe. But for that, in, or in order to achieve their fullest potential, they need to be accompanied through their integration process. Uh, so, first of all, they need to be informed about uh, their rights and obligations in the host society. Uh, you know, they must enjoy individual rights, which is not always the case, especially if they stay within the closed community sometimes. Uh, they need to have access to training and to be able to take full advantage of their skills and to be recognized. Uh, just... Uh, it just came to my mind right now, uh, a group of my friends in the Netherlands, they are working with, with migrant women to realize what skills do they have, because they might not even go through the formal education before, but they need to, uh, to just to realize what they are capable of. And then they might even even go on uh, in the, on the way for the certification of these skills, etc. Or getting 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 um, into into training, etc. Uh, so uh, that's uh, mm, that also shows that actually a lot of these uh, uh, this work with especially migrant women is done uh, by the civil society organizations. It's not done by the state. It's not done uh, by the, the formal education sector, for instance. And we need to acknowledge this and we need to support these civil society organizations in what they are doing because they, they, they many times step into uh, the area which would normally be done by the state, but it is not. Yes, the, the migration situation is definitely something that, that could keep us busy talking for the, for the rest of the afternoon. And, and, uh, and what we can see in the index is that there are, there are important issues to be solved in terms of, of, uh, of properly engaging also the, the migrant women and, and migrant men to, to the society, both for their benefit and for the benefit of, of Europe. But now let's move to, to the area of, of disabilities, which was also one of, uh, one of the focus areas uh, in this analysis. Birko, I understand that you prepared um, a little statement for us. Would you like to? Well, that? segment is a fine word. If I may start um, and comment on the last discussion about uh, the refugee situation, we need also to be aware that among the refugees are very many people who are traumatized who have psychosocial uh, disabilities or long-term problems, mental health problems, but also people with uh, disabilities are among the refugees. And this is something that has not been fully fully recognized or fully, fully uh, reacted to. My own country, Finland, has formerly been very active in, uh, in trying to um, in its uh, policies to to consider also the those in most vulnerable situation including um, including refugees with disabilities and that is very laudable and and should be replicated in other countries but also there is uh, we have seen and we have experienced <coughs> that uh, people who are in this process that they are best helped with uh, NGO projects, civil society projects, and a kind of peer support. We've seen also that disability is a very sensitive um, and uh, difficult subject to deal with in, in many communities. But um, going to the analysis, as I would say, the the key issue, as I said already, is that we see that the progress is stalling. We are not moving forward. It's like the, it's like the aeroplane I saw in a disaster movie that 
was g going up and accelerating from the from the runway and then it went up and up and up and then it started going down again <laughs> and you knew that something bad was going to happen when it started to go down again and this stalling which is a, a aviation term i think also uh, something very serious is happening now in the gender equality area we are stalling the progress is stalling and particularly women with disabilities are very much at risk of falling ever ever further behind um, in uh, in the areas of education and labor market and i would again uh, highlight and uh, stress the importance to continue work against gender based violence there's some progress uh, being made of course but the progress is very slow and again i have to have to quote a fra study on domestic violence that stated that women have three to five times more risk of falling um, victims of domestic violence if they have a disability and worst part of uh, the situation is that Many of the services we have today to support women victims of violence, they fail to be fully inclusive or and accessible for women with disabilities. So we are very far from the from the targets and goals and uh, and responsibilities set by the international conventions, such as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Istanbul Convention. And this is some the violence issue is something that very easily uh, may fall behind on the agenda because it's such a crowded agenda. So we've done uh, um, this work for so long. Can't we do something else for a change? No, we can't. We must continue, and we must energize our efforts. And. Also, in this context, when we talked about the civil society organizations, I must say that the austerity of many years, even including my own country, uh, has eroded many of the support systems of third sector organizations. So the outreach to minority women or women who are facing multiple situations of discrimination is often left to NGOs or networks that are very much under threat, very fragile under financial pressures. So these financial pressures for this good work m must all, all be recognized. And in both gender equality and disability law, policy and practice, they don't take into account the rights of women and girls with disabilities. When I look at the situation, I see also, I see also a way forward. And I think, uh, while many actors, particularly civil society organisations, women organisations, and active women give their best effort in defence of women in vulnerable situations, there is much that remains to be done, and we need more focus on having, and and creating, and not creating in the sense of making up numbers, but having fully integrated and disaggregated data, as Maru already mentioned, and as is required, for instance, by the CRPD. And now I'm very analogic, I'm turning the page. Excuse me. So, in, in my view, again, this analogic world, we should be digital. Um, this is my comment on the on the on the how much the digital gap is also a gender gap. When you are planning the European digital policies, look at the gender gap. Um, but to find the solutions, where do we go? How can we go forward? I think the best way is that we work together with women and girls with disabilities and their representative organizations so that we are taken into account 
we become partners in developing, implementation, and evaluating the policies so that the voices of women and girls with disabilities are heard in the national, regional, and European level, and that they also influence the way the policies are shaped. I see it now in this building. It has wonderful accessibility features for someone like myself. It didn't, it didn't used to have, but now it does. So there are some ways that we can go forward. And I think to do it together so that the government organizations, European organizations, will include also civil society and persons with disabilities, women and girls with disabilities, and organizations representing them is the best way forward. Thank you very much for, for this insight. Are there any other thoughts uh, in the panel on, on what measures could be done to, to ensure gender equality among uh, people with disabilities? Rena. Well, you mentioned the word digital, and uh, I think this is a precisely the avenue uh, which uh, we are as a commission exploring because we have uh, very important projects in e-health and m-health yeah. precisely in order to help uh, uh, the people with the different kind of disabilities to, to improve their living standards, to get opportunities and to gender as well to evolve in their participation in social life. Uh, I would like to mention here that there is a directive uh, making on making the websites and mobile apps in uh, public sector bodies more accessible, which entered in force on the 22nd of December We are now last looking year. forward to national implementation. And we are exactly looking forward to national implementation because this is targeting precisely member states and the public bodies. Yeah. How to make the life of the people uh, with disabilities, should it be blind or should it be other dif difficulties, more uh, equal and more uh, able to to make a, uh, the best use of the digital technologies. And uh, yes, so this is uh, another aspect that we are looking at in the designing of our future policies, gender-oriented in the social sphere as well. Ernest, you will. Uh, ju just may, uh, one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on the policies in the field uh, of uh, fighting against discrimination of, uh, of uh, people with disabilities. I think it was very interesting to hear what, what you were proposing. What I wanted to say is that I, we have the impression from the side of the, U uh, of the European Parliament that the agenda for social policies is a bit stuck at the moment yeah. in general. Okay. It's not stuck, it's completely... It, it's completely stuck. Let's yeah. <laughs> Okay, completely stuck then. Okay, I'll join your voice here. Okay, um, I'm not that much looking to the Commission here because I think we have... Ma 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 the main problems are, are, are what, what everything that is blocked in the moment in the Council. Uh, we, I have to tell you, we were extremely disappointed with the withdrawal of the maternity leave directive. But this is because, of course, we know that it was absolutely impossible to, to get that directive um, to go through in the Council. Now, of course, we are now working on, on an alternative, and we are happy, very happy to, uh, to, to do that together with the Commission. But there is, I think that there should be a general call from all of us to our member states, to the Council, that they cannot continue to block continually the agenda on uh, fighting discrimination, etc. And now I'm thinking particularly in one instrument that has been blocked for years, which is, the, which is the horizontal directive, yeah. uh, the anti-discrimination directive, which will be an extremely useful tool to tackle discriminations here and there, and particularly also with, uh, uh, to fight discrimination against, people, uh, uh, against uh, um, uh, people with disabilities. And we absolutely need that instrument to go through. So I think this is one of the things also it's important for all of us to, to, to mention. We want, again, a strong agenda in the field of, uh, of fighting discrimination. And, and, and unblocking that directive would be an extremely good signal. We just join the, the call for unblocking the Equal Treatment Directive. That's uh, one of the three pieces of legislation I wanted to, to mention, but uh, Pirko already mentioned the, t the first two ones. That yeah. means the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, UNCRPD, United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which 
bill, we in the committee believe that should be fully integrated into the European Bill of Social Rights. If we have an, a, a one big overarching agenda, why isn't it uh, actually mainstreamed there uh, uh, in, in, in such a way uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that it would be uh, visible and, and uh, uh, for us, uh, the, the, fun the well-functioning pillar of social rights is uh, of crucial importance. Yeah. And then, of course, equal treatment directive, and, and uh, we have been insisting on its unblocking for uh, four years. So let's uh, let's make a joint pressure on that. Yeah. There were very many important elements here mentioned and, and also what's important yeah. in this discussion and I hope the Gender Equality Index can, can contribute to that discussion is that there is also a gender element in, in, this, in all of this and, and for example when, when you look at the, um, uh, the proportion of, of disabled women compared to disabled men who are active in, in, in work life it is, the difference is, is big. Mother, correct me if I'm wrong but uh, I think it's 45% of women who are not working, yeah. and 35% of men, and there, there, is a, there is a big big gap there. And there's also an education gap, mm, which goes together. Which is even yeah. bigger yeah. and goes much together with this. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, before we open the floor for the, for the audience to ask questions, I'd like to address just one more element in that, and that's the work-life balance package, yeah. which, which is very high on the, on the political agenda now, and there is a lot of discussion around it. How do you feel that what, what new pathways would we need uh, in, to, that, to that package? How can, how can we make it uh, an important and effective tool to, to improve the economic independence and equal, equal sharing of care duties? Well, we see that there are big differences still in Europe. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could begin for a change, uh, because we were having a, a heavy discussion about the work-life balance package on just on Monday this week. Yeah. Uh, and you know that the Economic and Social Committee is composed of employers, employees, trade unions, and other civil society organizations. And we are supposed to reach the dynamic compromise. Well, this time we were having a very dynamic discussion about, <laughs> uh, about uh, let's say, the legislation measures, uh, about uh, paternity and parental leave and, uh, and uh, carers leave and stuff like that. But I consider that uh, maybe even more important are the non-legislative measures. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, it's uh, about ensuring accessible, affordable and quality formal care services. And we, here we are very unhappy that Barcelona targets, which should have been met already by uh, 2010, have not been met yet. And this is, I think that actually that was uh, the reason for, for, for many of the inequalities shown in, in, in the data today already. Uh, and uh, then actually I was uh, just thinking about my mom, who was taking care for, for my grandma uh, for several years on the account of, uh, of, of her own professional career. And she could only do that because actually she was working in my father's company. Otherwise, actually, uh, I think about other women who, who have to uh, basically to, to, to interrupt their careers or even finish their careers because they simply care about uh, about their relatives. Uh, then uh, we also uh, very much uh, support reducing tax and benefits disincentives for, for women to work more. And last but not least, actually, I would uh, again uh, like to reiterate the need to recognize uh, and increase the role of social partners and civil society organizations in that. Because we know that uh, civil society organizations are de facto playing an important role in providing services to, uh, to families across the EU. And it's not only about the child care, it's, about, uh, it's, uh, it's also about uh, helping the persons with disabilities or older persons. And in this respect, we also, uh, we also, uh, we've been also su suggesting uh, that uh, we need to address uh, the, the gender gap in pensions. Uh, because that's that's something which is which is related to care, 
Uh, and we are suggesting that actually this gender gap in pensions could be reduced by adding uh, the family time, e.g. The, 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 the time spent with children or, or in elderly care assisting a family member during a short uh, or long illness. And so this all should feed into the pension accumulation systems. I can only echo what Pavel has said because I think uh, uh, the work-life balance proposal is a complex proposal. I completely understand your frustration on the withdrawal of the previous instrument, but uh, this is our reply from the side of the Commission to your question, how we can prove. So uh, we have uh, proposed this uh, April a set of the measures, legislative and non-legislative. The legislative, they have four components for those being in the, in the room and not being familiar, so we're proposing incentives in terms of the paternity leave, parental leave, um, in terms of the carer's leave, and this is very important as well in terms of the improving the care about elderly and disabled uh, people, uh, and the flexible working arrangements. And uh, this package of the legislative proposals is accompanied by the non-legislative uh, uh, part, which is partially on uh, on uh, data collection, it is about the uh, co collection of data, but it is very much as well about the funding, funding of the preschool care. And uh, I was quite pleased to see on the index uh, release that, uh, for example, in Malta, uh, the, uh, Malta is the champion in the uh, employment, and Malta is precisely, I don't know whether somebody from Malta here in the room, uh, yes, so congratulations, because uh, Malta uh, introduced a free preschool to child care for everybody. And here you see the results. And uh, even in the country of my own, so I can see the significant improve in terms of the employment um, and reduction of the gender pay gap as well, uh, precisely because of the changes of the legislation. We understand that there are many models and we are not here to impose a one single policy to member states which are different uh, culture of uh, family um, for decades and for, the, for, the, for the many years. But we would like to propose a minimum standards. We would like to propose the choices. The choices to be taken at the level of the family, the choices to be taken by mothers, but as well by the, par by the fathers. Because parents are another very important component is this, in, this, in this game. Uh, on that file, I have to be honest with you, we are a bit like trapped between what we believe in the parliament, what we believe is fair and what we believe is realistic. Also, also because, uh, well, I was a bit annoyed when the council uh, with the previous package was telling us that we were to blame because we, we, put to, we put it to ambition to the last text. I mean, this is frankly uh, not, uh, not, not really acceptable. So anyway, let's forget about previous package. This is an old story. I mean, we're very happy to work with the commission on the new one. So um, what our feeling, and um, of course you can expect that the parliament will put uh, uh, more ambition that, uh, than what, what you presented. This is our job, so it's, I think this is, this is normal. Um, what we have to be uh, careful is that I don't want to have a framework at EU level that actually has no uh, concrete impact on the side of the member states. Uh, so it, this package doesn't produce concrete change uh, if we think okay let's send something to the council that will be not controversial that everybody will accept and that nobody will have really uh, problems in implementing then we will fail uh, and I'm a bit concerned by for instance with the proposal on the paternity leave uh, standards I think it's too low uh, it's too low and m probably the reason to put it that low is that then nobody will say anything in the council no there is a need on the side of the Commission and the Parliament to, to, to give a joint battle to the Council to say this package will oblige some of you member states to do something and to actually provoke concrete change. And this is actually what's, what politically uh, uh, is important. So to avoid sending something in the Council which is, okay, we had the experience that last directive was, was withdrawn, Let, let's, let's, send, se let's send something which will have no major impact but everybody would accept. This is a no-go for us. I think we have to do something ambition. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to comment on that, that if the USA and the 
then Soviet Union would have approached um, going to the moon the same way that Council approaches uh, the package, work-life package, they would still be building their rockets. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for this. Now let's uh, see if we have questions here on the floor. I understand that we've got some coming in through Slido as well. Anybody who would like to ask a question? Yeah. Please, you've got some microphone there next to your chair. Can you please introduce yourself first? And Hello, thank you. My name is Sarah Chanda from the European Network Against Racism. I want to thank you for the uh, completely illuminating discussion and also for the initial uh, informative presentation on the origins of intersectionality and where it came from. Um, as you said, the concept of intersectionality was originally invented to recognize the, uh, the conjoined uh, experiences of, of racism and sexism of black women in the US and later women of color. Uh, you also mentioned that because of the data constraints, it cannot be something that is included in the index. And yet we see a discussion and, a, and unfortunately a report which does not uh, consider the intersection experiences of women of color in the European Union, which extend to an unequal access to housing, to education, to employment and an overrepresentation in almost all spheres of, in, in, of inequality. Uh, my question to you, to, to all of the panel, in, is how in your spheres of work can we improve this overcoming in the data, but also in the narrative? May I make one suggestion, which is that if we are then talking about intersectionality, please let us not remember, uh, let us not forget, sorry, the origins of intersectionality the fact that the concept is about the intersection of racism and sexism, and also look to how the European Union as an employer can, uh, can in its own uh, in, uh, workforce, redress some of these issues, meaning including the diversity of its panels and of its workforce, collecting data on that issue, and pushing forward its own uh, policies on positive action for women of color in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Who would like to, to pick on that? Maybe Marta first. Yes, thank you for, for your comment and question. Uh, indeed, we do not want to forget all the uh, origin of intersectionality, but also other grounds which we are not able to cover. And uh, we did work very hard to see what kind of data it is to, uh, that we can uh, find, which is comparable enough. But yes, um, these kind of issues, unfortunately, are politically very sensitive. And uh, how do we get the data? We go uh, with questionnaires, the statistical offices of national statistical offices go to the people and ask. And race, unfortunately, is one of these questions which is not recorded in the surveys because it's either even not allowed by legislation or, or, or regarded as sensitive there are other issues which are, which are not asked because of that. How to deal with this question, very difficult to say. It's, it's, it's really, really difficult to find the balance between the people's rights and, and fear of discrimination when you, or different treatment if you disclose some kind of information and the kind of public uh, interest and need that we have in, as regards of statistics. So unfortunately, I do not have a good answer to that. But yes, we keep keep repeating and we do keep mentioning everything which is missing as much as possible. I'll maybe use this opportunity again to ask you and the plenary to push the national governments to finally help us to approve the horizontal Directive, because I think the Equal uh, Treatment Directive is uh, the, uh, the, the badly needed tool that we would need in order to uh, ensure the proper implementation and enforcement in all the member states. 
So this is, uh, of course, there is a full commitment from the side of the Commission to continue. We are using our current tools, uh, funding, uh, mutual learning, sharing of, the, sharing of the best practices. And last but not least as well, uh, we are working very closely with uh, different segments, with the social partners, uh, business community as well, uh, promoting the diversity in the workplace. And uh, we have many different projects we are trying to uh, disseminate as publicly as possible in order to improve the situation. Okay, thank you. So, so not a not a very clear answer to to you, but but uh, definitely something that that is uh, is important to raise and and to keep in mind in in all levels. Any other questions? Uh, we've got one. You need to switch it on. I think the microphone. Hello. Yes. There you go. Uh, Mary Collins from the European Women's Lobby. Thank you very much um, for the presentation. I think this data has been long overdue. and We've been able to identify key gaps and missing information still. But my concern really is about how do we ensure now that everything that has emerged from the index this year can actually be fed into current mechanisms and processes so that it doesn't remain on the sideline. And we'll be back again in two years' time saying, oh, it's terrible, it's not improving. So I think it's very timely for the European semester process, which is about to begin. In one month's time, we can expect the annual growth survey. Can we expect as well to have a real firm political commitment, like we said this morning in the previous panel, on gender equality in that? There's also the country reports that will be drafted and subsequently will lead to country-specific recommendations. I think we expect to see um, recommendations that will actually address these issues that have been raised here today. Secondly, then, the issue of care policies. They've come across extremely strongly. We are lacking in care services right across the European Union. And therefore, there, we should be pushing the European Investment Bank, who has adopted a gender equality strategy last December, to actually start massive investments in the care economy in Europe. And then finally, I'd just like to say that the discussion we had on migration and uh, refugees, I think there's ample documentation out there that shows that women, women's human rights have been violated right across the board. And I think it shows as well in terms of the discussion that we absolutely need a strategy on equality between women and men post-2019. Thank you. Anyone who wants to reflect on that, how shall we change the word cloud that we drew earlier today and, and make it uh, to positive statements? Well, I would like to react to your proposal on the European semester because I think this is one of the most important tools we have in, uh, in hands. Indeed, the social pillar principles, the 20 principle out of them, I think three or four are directly related to the gender equality and uh, issues we have discussed until now. So uh, we'll focus, uh, the, the European semester will focus on those principles. So we do expect and we are proposing a practical uh, implementation through the uh, drafting of the uh, national, uh, national reform program and the uh, staff working documents. And um, uh, another a uh, tool, as, uh, we meant, as the Commissioner mentioned this morning, was the preparation of the action plan, how to tackle the gender pay gap as well. So I wanted to, because this will come in a synergy, uh, uh, second half of, of the, actually the second week of November, we would like to launch it. So this will be uh, a very important synergetic moment precisely to enhance uh, the needs uh, as expressed uh, uh, by you, but as we have seen uh, clearly in the outcome of the index. Very briefly, two things. Well, on your last point on the strategy, I cannot agree more with you. We have been uh, calling uh, for the Commission to have, to have that strategy for 2018. I think this would be extremely important that we get back to that. Even the Council called for that. Uh, the Council called the Commission to have a strategy. Let me remind you that. So it would be good <laughs> that the Commission for once listens to Council. <laughs> Uh, not even, not, not only the, not, not, not the parliament. Okay, no, and and um, and on the first point on the semester, um, this is one imp very important battle, and I, I have to tell you, in the last years, I was outraged to see some country-specific recommendation with absolutely no gender perspective. And I can tell you, if if you take my country, Spain, where the national, the the country-specific recommendation related to what was needed in terms of pension reform. 
uh, the cuts in social services, etc., in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get the budget, the national budget, back to the, to the criteria of the, Ma of, uh, of the Maastricht Treaty, there was no gender perspective at all. And, of course, now we know what the gender impact has, uh, has had um, in my country uh, regarding those policies. The last reform uh, of the pension system that came also as a country-specific recommendation in the semester process was an absolute disaster that will affect the pensions of many women because, uh, because by, uh, by, for instance, by punishing in the calculation of your pension temporary work, as they did, you're punishing women. And this happened uh, through the process of the semester and the country-specific recommendation, and this is not acceptable. So uh, actually getting gender perspective in the process of the semester is very important. And I have to tell you, this is a very difficult battle. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the, in the FEM committee, in the Gender Equality Committee. I'm sitting as well in the Economic Affairs Committee. I haven't been able to pass one single amendment on gender equality in the Econ Committee regarding, uh, regarding the semester. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, I think, and I think we need to be aware that this is a battle that we need to fight. And, and finally, on, the, on, on uh, how to play with the index, I think it's important that we include the index in all those processes. Uh, one of the things I was very proud to do with my report on gender equality in the Parliament is to include the last index as an official annex of my report. And I think this is something, I think it was a good idea to do so. It was an idea of Blanca, who is sitting here, my assistant. Uh, uh, so thanks for the idea. Uh, and uh, I think it was important, and we need absolutely that in the implementation of this policy in the semester, the index is taken into account. Thank you. You can have a very quick reflection, and then, then we take one more question, and then we will close. Just very briefly, who would disagree with, uh, with uh, the, the suggestions of my colleagues and uh, with the suggestion of yours? Uh, I just would like to make a commitment here. Uh, I will take uh, the, 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 the Equality Index uh, to the committee, and I will ask my colleagues dealing with different, uh, different subjects, Roma, disabled, uh, migrants, etc., to take this into account and to, uh, to, to suggest how they are going to work with that uh, um, in, in the year 2018 and onwards. So Very good. We welcome that uh, commitment. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take one more question here. And, uh... Uh, hello, everyone. Actually, it's really inspiring to listen to you all, but also very sad. And I agree with uh, Ms. Uh, Malamaki. I'm sorry. I'm yes. It's okay. It was brilliant. Um, yes. Okay. Um, the thing is that uh, still a lot of those issues are invisible because we don't have critical mass. And I agree with you. It's really difficult to pass any amendment. I myself am a member of Lithuanian Parliament. A woman, as you can see, and with disability. I have uh, a bit over a third of uh, my working abilities. And we are invisible. We are unheard. And that's why intersectional analysis is sometimes, in my opinion, too superficial. Women with disabilities are not only very, um, have very little access to education and workforce, but we have extremely little access to political decision making. I was working for 13 years as a human rights defender, as an NGO, and finally I had to go to the parliament to make some changes happen. And believe me, what a wave of uh, surprise and uh, negative attitude I met. What the hell is she doing going to politics? Should she not care about her health? Women with disability in parliament? Oh, come on. So that's why I believe that, you know, this political power this willpower and leadership may happen only when people who are currently in the positions to be heard start talking more about maybe introducing again quota concept, maybe actually reviving it but because it's dying in most of the spheres. So I want to ask all of you, what do you think about this, about quota concept? Can it be revived? About how we can actually touch the most sensitive places of intersectional analysis and also any commitment or ideas on how to make leaders talk about that, about those of us who are invisible? Can I just say that last weekend we had a, we had a, a, a meeting and a seminar in Estonia um, in terms of the Estonian presidency about just this issue. 
participation in uh, in European elections being disenfranchised as voters and as candidates uh, when we are disabled. That is a very major issue highlighted by the CRPD, and I look and I laud your courage in doing that and in going to the parliament and in doing the work you're doing. Um, and sometimes it's very, very, it can be personalized. So you become attacked personally that it's only you when in actual fact there are 100,000 behind you. So that is something that is very important that we encourage people to participate also in the political processes and to and to trust the political processes because for for particularly for women with disabilities the it's important that that we are heard we are visible we are in the room uh, uh, in the not only discussing disability issues, but also other issues, because there is a specific perspective that comes with living with disability that might help create better and more inclusive policies for also other other minorities and people in vulnerable situations. And and it's I applaud your contribution. That's just what I wanted to say and highlight the fact that there are hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of European citizens who are disenfranchised from the European Parliament voting at the moment because of national legislation that is counter to the CRPD articles on, on political participation and, and um, self-determination. So this is a very important topic that you raised. Thank you very much. Now, very quick reflections here. How, what do, you feel, how do you feel about quotas? Would they help the issue? They always had. Um, I think that the, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, former pra Spanish Prime Minister Zapatero introduced quotas in the electoral system. It worked uh, to get more women in the uh, in, in parliament and uh, uh, electoral positions. If we take, for instance, the um, the uh, the economic uh, the economic um, sector where, where we have a problem we really have a problem of having women in management boards the Norwegian model works and this is we ha you, you just have to see the data eh? after the introduction of the quotas we have more women in in management positions so again will we be able to unblock the women on board, on board directive that is one of the other directives that are blocked. I think we have to fight for that, and I'm absolutely in favor of introducing quotas. You, we just have to see the results where the quotas have been introduced. It simply works. Anything further? Uh, you, you know our strong commitment from the Commission, so we pursue the Member States, uh, and this is the fourth instrument that you have mentioned that we absolutely need to have uh, uh, finally adopted. Women in board had a kind of the snowballed effort. Uh, uh, because we have seen the effects in the in the in the public sphere as well, not only in the in the business sphere, which I think is important. Uh, we are now discussing the uh, new legislation or the amended legislation on the next uh, European elections uh, um, uh, list uh, formation and funding of the political parties. But again, so we've been proposing, let's say, the commitment. Uh, but uh, it is so sensitive for member states to go for the clear commitment in terms of the quota that it will simply not go through. So we have at least a kind of the commitment to take uh, to take into the account the gender balance, but that's maximum we can achieve, unfortunately. But uh, one more element, the colloquium, as mentioned uh, by Commission this morning as well, so we'll have one focused uh, workshop precisely dedicated to the uh, female participation or gen uh, gender participation in the political life, and we believe that it will trigger more interest uh, among the women over the whole of Europe. Thank you. And finally, finally, I got uh, the opportunity to be a rebel in the room, <laughs> but unwillingly, to be honest, uh, because uh, although I'm personally a friend of quota, uh, my 
previous, actually my two experiences from different environments uh, say that I need to be a bit more cautious. As a former civil servant, I know how the, how the ministries uh, especially are very much uh, afraid of any kind of quota. Uh, and here I applaud your decision to, 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 to decide to go to the politics and to, to try to change it with your personal, uh, personal approach. Uh, and actually in the European Economic and Social Committee, especially regarding the Women on Board Directive, actually we were having very difficult discussions because obviously one group uh, was very strongly against uh, that uh, and we would, uh, you can guess which one, uh, 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 and uh, and uh, they they had their 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 arguments, of course. Uh, so uh, I need to be very careful regarding this quota. But on the other hand, uh, when we talk about the quotas for disabled and others, I think that actually they are bringing bringing their fruits as any kind of quota because that's why they are here for. Well, this sounds like a good, good uh, topic for lunchtime discussion. Yeah. Uh, so we would li now like to thank very much our panel, uh, panel this uh, late morning. And uh, now we will break for lunch. We will come back at 2.30. The lunch is at the same place where we had coffee break. Now we are at the same time having a press conference in the second floor. So if we have any journalists here among the audience, please join uh, Rainer standing there by the, by the door. He will guide you to the, to the right place. And uh, see you in an uh, hour and a bit. <laughs>